Well, if you listen to the corporate media or the Biden administration, you'll hear the often repeated phrase, Russia's unprovoked war in Ukraine. It's used so much as a piece of propaganda that people begin to believe it. It's repeated all over mainstream media, corporate media, even though if it's not actually true. And our next guest has written an extensive book on the subject, and he's done a remarkable job showing us how unprovoked war is really a total lie once you dive into the data and the history. The book is called How the West Brought War to Ukraine. I highly recommend it. One of the best books I've read this year, and I think a very important book for all of us to be reading right now. The author of that book is a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Abelow, and he joins me now. Benjamin, great to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Well, after I put your book down a few months ago, I said we've got to get Benjamin here on the show. This is a story that needs to be told because even this week, the State Department just released their yearly assessment of human rights violations their yearly assessment of countries around the world, which are corrupt. And every year they do this. The State Department does this every year. And in this week's new State Department assessment of Ukraine, they go to great lengths to explain how the country is corrupt, individuals disappear, democracy is not really in Ukraine. And they often repeat that phrase throughout their report that Russia's unprovoked war in Ukraine. So even the State Department repeating this lie in their current assessment of one of the most corrupt countries in the world. So this continues, Benjamin. So I just want to get your assessment maybe at a high level before we dive into some of the specifics of how the West did bring war to Ukraine. What is your sort of propaganda view right now of how the media continues to push this, this agenda? Yeah, the agenda definitely continues to be pushed. Unprovoked war. And I feel like I'm also seeing increasingly now full-scale invasion <clears throat> which also is not accurate. Uh, sending in 190,000 troops is not how you try to invade and occupy a large country. So I think it was a limited operation designed to be a kind of coercive diplomacy to try to force Ukraine into a position of neutrality, which they had attempted to do in various ways before then. And I think it reflects the real desire of Russia and their whole purpose of what happened was that they were seeking a neutral Ukraine one that was not going to function as a, a military threat, uh, especially a projective arm of U.S. military power right on their border. Uh, so I think that's how I see it. In terms of the general question of whether it was provoked or unprovoked, I think the people will often go back to uh, you know the beginning of the invasion and treat it as if that's coming out of nowhere, where in fact, I think one needs to go back uh, over a decade, probably go back to 2007 or 2008, when it became very clear that Russia was not going to take uh, NATO expansion sitting down. So they didn't take it sitting down, and it's been a slow burn for those years. And it seems the West doesn't want to acknowledge the lengths the, that which Putin and Russia went to try to stop the expansion of NATO. I mean, even going back to when Bill Clinton promised Vladimir Putin that NATO would not accelerate and exceed certain boundary lines, that, of course, was a lie and that happened. I often think, Benjamin, how the United States would respond. I mean, we have our Monroe Doctrine in the United States, right, which is just a piece of paper that holds no real sway anywhere other than it's our own paper that we wrote in the United States. You cannot put missiles in Cuba. You cannot put military bases in the Western Hemisphere. See, we have this Monroe Doctrine. You cannot encroach here in the Western Hemisphere. Again, it's our own document. There's no binding contract with the United Nations or anything else. How would we respond if a Russian-China version of a NATO started putting military bases throughout Canada, throughout Mexico, in Hawaii, islands adjacent to Hawaii? What would we do? Yeah, I think that's a great way of framing it. Uh, certainly the U.S. would react uh, very strongly. I think it's almost certain the U.S. would, uh, first of all, they would have tried to get the weapons or the military exercises out of there. But had that not been successful, I think it's very likely the U.S. would have gone to war too. And this points to a really important issue. People will often think of Russian paranoia. And I think one way of debunking that myth, and it really is a myth, is just, as you say, just to look at how the U.S. would respond if the situation were, were reversed. And, well, if Russia's paranoid, then the U.S. is certainly paranoid, too. 
And most countries, I think, if they were in a position to actually resist, would also act in this quote unquote paranoid way. This is really how I think, whatever one may think of what the norm is, I think this is, con they react in a way that's consistent with the norm of how a quote unquote prudent military or political leader would react to an encroachment of a military, foreign military force on their border. This week, we see, of course, $61 billion now being sent by the United States Congress, President Biden signing it into law, saying, quote, when he was signing it, he said, this is a great move for world peace, which I just about laughed and fell out of my chair when I read that. So sending $61 billion in new weapons so Ukrainians can die is how we achieve world peace. OK, uh, yeah. will this, you know, the Daily Beast actually has a really interesting piece. You and I were talking about this before the interview here. And the Daily Beast, which is a liberal website by all accounts, um, is, went to great lengths in this piece to point out how all of this money flowing into Ukraine is actually going to be detrimental to Ukraine. Um, so I'm curious, as you look at this money that's about to flow into Ukraine, what is your assessment of that? And, and maybe you can walk us through what this Daily Beast piece reports as well. Yeah, it was really a fascinating piece in the Daily Beast. I don't follow media uh, closely or popular media closely, but from what I understand, Daily Beast is quite a liberal mouthpiece. And uh, therefore, it's in some ways especially surprising and perhaps important, I would hope, that this piece was published there. Uh, this was basically an article constructed around a series of interviews that the Daily Beast reporters held with fighters, uh, regular citizens, and also frontline fighters in the Kharkiv region. Uh, and basically, most of the people they interviewed said they viewed the provision of increased US aid as a kind of disaster that would uh, do nothing but promote the war without actually leading to any kind of victory. And the people there expressed quite directly, which I also found very interesting that the, um, the Daily Beast reported on this, a number of the people said that what's really needed are as a negotiated end to the uh, to the war. So uh, you know, it's it's easy to be overly optimistic about the significance of a piece like this, uh, and I don't want to go there. But you know, hopefully, it reflects some gradually evolving change in the U.S. Uh, popular mindset, and ultimately reflected in Congress. Well, and here you have the Ukrainian soldiers and the Ukrainian people saying, oh, God, no, please do not send more weapons, do not send more money, because that will lead to the destruction of what's left of Ukraine. I mean, you're hearing it right from their mouths. We show on this show repeatedly the graveyards, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians dead. The reports now over the past week have it over 500 to 600,000 dead Ukrainians, over yeah. a million maimed permanent injuries, loss of arms, legs, eyes concussions, yeah. psychotic episodes. Um, this is tearing the country apart, and yet the West can sort of sit back, throw their hands up and say, this is great for the West. Ukraine can do all the fighting and dying, as Jen Stoltenberg, the head of NATO this week, just said. It's, it's a great investment for the West. They can do all the dying, and we can do all of the winning. I mean, this is really, I think, how the West sees this, is it not? Yeah, it's kind of... Um I was going to say psychopathological, maybe you could call it psychopathy or socio sociopathy, uh, sickness, uh, hard heartedness to the point of illness, almost, I would say, um, mm. you know, my basic perspective, it's, it's very similar to Colonel McGregor's. I've seen a couple of the excellent interviews you had with him. And of course, I've seen him in other places as well. I think his point is a very good one. And it's the point that I and others have been making as well that this war really is not for Ukraine's benefit. Uh, I think in the mind of some of the people who are wanting to provide this aid, they, they imagine or fantasize that it is. But I think what's really happening is a, really the destruction of an entire generation of young people in Ukraine, destruction of physical property, the whole infrastructure. Uh, you know, I think what's probably gonna happen if this doesn't escalate in some horrific way is that the end result will just be Ukraine will become a destroyed country and they'll lose an entire generation of young men. Uh, the people who are not killed or wounded will be, uh, many of them will be traumatized, both civilians and military people. So, you know, the, the entire notion that somehow the provision of aid is a humanitarian venture, 
I think is, you know, not only inaccurate, but it's completely the reverse of what's true. It's a kind of, you know, thinking of the quotes that you just gave from some of the American congressional leaders, that this is a cheap way for us to attack Russia, uh, you know, on somebody else's life, uh, maybe our dime, but it's somebody else's life. Uh, unfortunately, it's much more than a dime. And um, yeah, that's the situation. It's, it's terribly unfortunate. I want to get into some of your research in the book and how you came to this, this research. Maybe you can paint a picture. What was the moment you decided to go down this rabbit hole and have this undertaking to write this, this, this book about a subject that is, was certainly going to create an enormous amount of backlash, right? You're going against the grain here. Yeah. Well, uh, my background in this area is actually a discrete background that occurred several decades ago. I worked in Washington, D.C. for a, uh, an NGO uh, that was doing lobbying and uh, education work around the issue of nuclear arms. Uh, and at that time, it was actually with the Soviet Union. So I paid a lot of attention to the technical aspects of arms control, technical aspects of weapons deployment. And I really, my own uh, more advanced background is in medicine. I studied history as an undergraduate, European history at the University of Pennsylvania. And then I went on and studied medicine at Yale. Uh, and I wrote a couple of medical textbooks and I've been involved in other research projects. So it had been quite a few years since I really paid attention to some of the issues of geo, geopolitics, geostrategy. But when the Ukraine war started, I very quickly saw that there was potential for a real escalation, uh, even up to the nuclear level. And I still feel that way. Uh, fortunately, we haven't hit that point. But uh, I think there's a really great danger that most people in the West, they're busy thinking of how will this affect Ukraine? How will this affect Ukraine? Uh, how will this affect the US-Russian relationship? And they're not thinking clearly enough about that we are taking a, uh, it's a finite, but a real risk of escalation to a nuclear level. So what really caught my eye right off the bat was the possibility of nuclear escalation to the nuclear level. Um, and I wanted to get a, de I, I saw the military and the, I saw the nuclear aspects very clearly immediately, but I really did not have a deep understanding of the history of Ukraine. I had not followed that closely. So I basically just started digging into it, uh, you know, reading, listening to interviews, trying to basically backfill my knowledge. Uh, and as the more I learned, the more I saw just how ridiculous the whole thing was. It was a war that uh, I came to conclude that the U.S. was really ultimately responsible for bringing about through its missteps with NATO, with the European leaders kind of playing the role of um, uh how would I say it? I was going to say patsy, but that's not the right word. Um, the NATO basically followed in the footsteps of the U.S. walking right off a cliff into a very dangerous situation. And I think once they did that, they felt they had to keep deceiving the public about what the origins of the war were. So while I think it's quite possible there are some people who really believe this is all Russia's fault, I think that there are many people who really understand that the U.S. played a, a central role in bringing this war about but they now feel that they're so deeply dug into this hole that they can't acknowledge that publicly, which is one reason why I think it's very important that the U.S. populace and the public become educated. And one reason why I decided to write the book. So let's get into it then, because I hope our audience here, I think those of our viewers that watch our show on a regular basis understand a lot of how this started. But I'm, yes. it's my hope. It's my hope anyway that we're reaching a lot of new eyeballs today who really don't know and who are uneducated about how this happened. Can you take us back to maybe maybe the, the catalyst moment or the tipping point moment here? Uh, most people believe, right, that this all started when Russia just out of the blue decided to invade Ukraine two years ago and, you know, wanted to go in and, 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 and encircle Kiev and and take down Ukraine and annex this land and make it as part uh, make it part of broader mother Russia. But nothing could be further from the truth. Can you take us back at least a decade or so before that for the catalyst moments here? Sure. I, I think I'll go back to 2008. Uh, this was when the U.S. at uh, in Bucharest, Romania, asserted, when I say the U.S., the U.S. pressured other members of NATO to uh, make an assertion that Ukraine and Georgia will join NATO. 
Uh, and if you actually go back to the, um, uh, the Bucharest uh, memorandum for the 2008 conference, you actually see that it's even more than just a simple statement of they will join NATO. But if you read the whole paragraph, uh, you actually see that it's, it's quite a strong statement. People will sometimes say, oh, well, they didn't really intend to bring NATO in immediately. But it's actually quite clear they, it was a very strong statement that Ukraine and Georgia would join NATO. Um, uh, Putin responded very quickly to that, saying this will not happen. And what I think is uh, very important to point out also is it wasn't just Putin or the Russian leadership that was um, concerned about this. It was actually the National Intelligence Council of the United States. The National Intelligence Council is the uh, arm of the intelligence community that communicates with other areas of U.S. government about what U.S. policy should be and the intelligence implications. And at that time, uh, the National Intelligence Council concluded that if the U.S. went ahead and tried to bring Ukraine into NATO, that uh, Ukraine would not only go in and try to take Crimea, but they would actually launch a broader invasion. Uh, let's say they didn't state affirmatively, this definitely will happen. They said there's a, a real chance that, the, that Russia will not only take U, uh, Crimea, but will launch a broader invasion encompassing more of Ukraine itself. Now that was in 2008. And in fact, that's seven years before Russia ultimately went into Crimea. So we have statements from uh, a very important US intelligence body seven or eight years even before the annexation of Crimea, that the taking of um, uh, Crimea and the uh, invasion, which didn't happen, of course, till 2022, uh, would take place. Uh, the next thing I think I would point out would be uh, 2014, which was the so-called Maidan revolution, or some people refer to it as a coup. And in fact, there was both a popular revolt and there was a violent coup, and they both took place. Uh, and the U.S. was intimately involved in laying the foundation for that action. Uh, we know that as early as uh, 2013, Victoria Newland had stated uh, to a conference in Washington of a conference of Ukrainian, I believe they're business leaders, that the U.S. had already poured $5 billion into democracy promotion activities in Ukraine. Now, whether the open question that I think is an open question in general and is also an open question uh, for myself is at that stage, was the CIA actively involved in the violent phase of the coup? And I think we don't have enough information to know that. But I think it's very clear that the U.S. was involved in democracy and also that the U.S. went ahead after the coup occurred and publicly uh, acknowledged and um, uh, accepted the coup government uh, uh, in response to a coup, which really should not have been accepted because ultimately that took place as a result of a uh, Ukrainian unconstitutional vote in the Rada. Uh, so uh, to refocus on the point that you raised and the way you framed it, people have a natural tendency to look at the moment when the invasion started, uh, February 24th, I guess it was in October 20, uh, 2022. Uh, but we really need to go back, not even just to the events of the Maidan in 2014, but even further to at least 2008, and then look at what the very U.S. establishment, uh, National Intelligence Council itself, was warning about with respect to an ongoing attempt to bring Ukraine into NATO. And of course, there were even indications even before the invasion up until 2022 ahead of time. Uh, Putin, of course, meeting with with leaders, leaders of NATO, leaders of Ukraine, letting them know this is a red line for us, right? Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there were many points at which this uh, could have been nipped. Uh, to refer specifically to what you're talking about was in December of 2021, uh, Putin sent letters to both or formal communications to both NATO and the U.S. describing that there were a number of things he was seeking, but the main one was neutrality for Ukraine with respect to NATO. Uh, you know, one, one point that's also very important to make is that right after the war started, uh, literally the day after the war started, after Russia invaded, Russia was already communicating with Ukraine, stating that they were seeking peace 
under terms of Ukrainian neutrality. Uh, and this, I think, is a very important piece of information that's not always recognized or its significance is not always recognized. To me, what I think it does is it provides yet one additional layer of evidence that what Russia was really seeking was not any kind of territorial expansion, but they were actually seeking to uh, compel through a kind of coercive diplomacy, Ukraine to declare neutrality with respect to NATO. Uh, and in fact, as part of their offers at that time, they were apparently offering to withdraw all their troops to the pre-invasion uh, lines. So they would maintain Crimea. Uh, uh, they had not taken the Donbass territory. Uh, well, actually, at that point, they probably had affirmed the, uh, the annexation of the Donbass territories. But they basically said, we will withdraw our troops and the status, effectively to the status quo ante. Right. And that never happened. They could have gone back to those lines. And, you know, it is remarkable. One thing we try to remind our audience here is that the people that live in the Donbass, a large portion of them, of course, ethnic Russians that did not want to be a part of this 2014 government that was helped and installed by the United States and the, the CIA. Uh, they did not want a Western puppet government that was not representative of them. And so the shelling and the genocide had unfolded for about 10 years. People don't seem to understand that, as we've covered here extensively, the citizens who live in those areas have been under constant shelling from the Ukrainian side for over 10 years, killing innocent people, hitting school districts, hitting playgrounds, hitting villages, hitting markets. So that, I don't know why or where the Western government, where Western media was in those 10 years, but they certainly weren't covering that. Yeah, yeah. And if anything, I think they were actively involved. I think the U.S. government was actively involved in trying to squelch a solution to that problem known as the Minsk Accords, which were two documents that were signed in 2014 and 2015. Uh, but the U.S. had people in place uh, uh, in 2019, for instance, Kurt Volker and William Taylor were both very important point people for the U.S. government in Ukraine. And they were advocating for a very aggressive stance by Ukraine, uh, not a stance towards uh, that Ukraine might try to seek a peaceful settlement in the Donbass. You know, one of the point which I'll mention, which uh, again follows on the tales of what we were just saying about the Russian attempt to negotiate a peace settlement. As you know, it was the, largely the Western powers that broke up the possibility of a peace settlement that could have occurred right after this war uh, started. Uh, ultimately, we talk about what happened in um, uh, Istanbul, uh, and we talk about Boris Johnson coming to uh, Kiev and basically telling Zelensky, you know, you may be ready for peace, but we are not. Um, th there's very extensive evidence that while there was not a signed, a signed treaty yet, that the negotiations had reached a very advanced stage. For instance, the ex-Prime Minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett, uh, stated in an interview, he did a long four hour interview, uh, I think it was early 2023, if I recall the exact date, where among other things he revealed, and he was intimately involved in uh, negotiating. He had direct face to face meetings with Putin. He had phone conversations with Zelensky and was actually acting as a tempting act as a mediator between them. And his efforts seemed to have fed into the um, uh, Istanbul uh, negotiations. But one of the things that uh, uh, Naftali Bennett stated was that the, in the Istanbul negotiations, the draft treaties that were being worked out had actually reached a 17th or 18th draft uh, wow. in the agreement. So it was a very advanced stage of negotiation that, that was occurring. Uh, and the, nego the uh, uh, Ukrainian negotiators, uh, Alexei, Ar uh, Alexei Arist Aristovich, who was a uh, Zelensky aide, and uh, David Arakamian, who was actually the head of the Ukrainian negotiations, were very excited that this could be a very successful negotiation. In, in an interview that I think it was um, uh, uh, David Arakamian did, uh, actually stated that they were pulling out the champagne bottles uh, in response to the negotiations. Uh, but then this, of course, was broken up when the U.S. Uh, and it's, well, let's say when Boris Johnson came in and the assumption is that the U.S. was involved in that process, uh, basically said, you know, we're not in favor of this and we're not going to uh, provide security guarantees. But what we will do is give you a lot of money for more arms. 
Now, of course, if these negotiations had been allowed to go through and they had proved to be successful, uh, you know, the situation would be very different right now. Uh, we would have a, a Ukraine that was intact. We would have an entire generation of young men that had not been killed or traumatized or severely wounded. And of course, the country is being depopulated. I think they've lost, uh, what is it, a third or quarter of their population now, uh, either internally displaced or in, uh, I think there are 8 million people who have now left the country. So it's uh, really quite a mess that has occurred as a result of the actions of the West to oppose the uh, treaty. So then one has to ask the question, why? Why would the West want to foment this war? Why would the West want to bring war to Ukraine, as you write in the book? And there's a couple of interesting things that you point out in the book. And I just want to quote what something from your, one of your pages here. Further, one must consider, you say, what would happen if Russia started to lose and its overall military capacity was degraded to the point where Moscow perceived itself as vulnerable to invasion? In that situation, Russian planners would surely contemplate using low-yield battlefield nuclear weapons to destroy enemy forces. And they've said as much. This isn't like a fantasy. They've said it. And we're literally talking, you and I, as Poland is now considering allowing, or openly suggested, to allow nuclear weapons to be brought to, to Poland um, in response to Russian nukes uh, moving to Belarus. So we are moving towards this moment, which is what you talked about earlier in the interview. I, I think people don't realize what are they hoping for, right? Like, what is the West hoping for? If we degrade Moscow to the point where they feel threatened, danger, I mean, uh, I guess desperate people do desperate things. And if they get to a point of desperation, they will lash out in a way that we can't even contemplate. Yeah, certainly. As your listeners know from the various interviews you've, you've presented, uh, this really is for Russia perceived to be an existential matter. I mean, we really have uh, Western military powers right on Russia's border. We have a Ukraine that not only shares a 1200 mile uh, border with Russia, but was the primary uh, entry path through which uh, Nazi forces invaded Ukraine uh, during World War II, uh, leading to the death of 12 to 13 Russians in addition to uh, another 12 or 13 million who are uh, non-Russian Soviets. Uh, this is a kind of destruction that we in the West can barely think about, yet it played an important role in shaping uh, Russian uh, thinking and mindset. In addition to the fact, as we've already talked about, the U.S. would certainly take the same actions irrespective of that history. So, uh, yeah, it's very dangerous. The, the idea that somehow it is saber rattling on the part of Putin to even be speaking about the use of tactical nukes, if Russia perceived itself to be losing, it, it's a crazy idea. Uh, the, the weapons are there for a particular purpose. They're there to guard what Russia might perceive to be its vital interests. And although it certainly has no interest in using such weapons unnecessarily. It, of course, knows that that could escalate and uh, destroy Russia itself. But if it were really to come down to a situation where Russia was losing, I don't have any uh, doubt that they would start to consider using those weapons. So the U.S. is actually doing things that are extremely dangerous. Um, they're taking actions that are unlikely to be successful uh, and in the process destroying Ukraine but if they are successful, it could lead to escalation in nuclear war. So there really is really a presentation by the U.S. into a no-win situation, no win for anybody. Uh, right. uh, uh, or at least, let's say, uh, uh, if the West starts to win, which is what it claims to want, it could be provoking a wider war and a nuclear war which would destroy not only could destroy if it escalated not only Western Europe, but the US itself. So it's a kind of madness that the very thing the West claims to want is precisely the kind of thing that could provoke Russia to uh, initiate the use of nuclear weapons. Hmm. That's a great point. And as you write in the book, what would we get if we had a collapsed Putin regime, you know, or a, we, we, we call it a Putin regime, right? But if there's not a Putin government, if this government collapses, and it cascades into turmoil, you know, when Benjamin Netanyahu asked the United States government to invade Libya, to invade Iraq, 
you know, we did the bidding, of course. And of course, we know what we got in Libya now, a total failed state, a disaster. Um, yeah. We know what we have in Iraq as a disaster. As a res- And of course, the, they want us to do the same in Iran right now. So we could uh, have a disaster there as well. I guess we would have a disaster in Russia with a destroyed government. And what would be left? We'd have madmen maybe getting their hands on nuclear weapons. Remember, this is a country you point out in the book that has more nuclear weapons than I think anyone in the world, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, it is a kind of craziness. The, there's a kind of fantasy in the West, and this is certainly at least among uh, some of the people who are driving this war, that they think that they can uh, drive Putin from power, or they used to think that anyway. Uh, I don't know what they think now. Um, but it's a kind of madness, because even in the unlikely circumstance that that could have occurred, and I don't think it was ever any reason to think that it could have occurred, but let's say that it, it had occurred, once again, the U.S. gets its way. Well, what are we left with? We're left with uh, other possibilities. Who, is, who would come into leadership? I think it's much more likely that instead of some liberal democratically oriented leader, and there are very few of those left, by the way, now, uh, what we would really get would be someone who was further on the right in terms of uh, Russian nationalist forces. Um, I personally view uh, Putin as a prudent, uh, extremely rational player. And in some ways, I think he was probably the very best that we could be having in the West during a period when Russia was gaining, uh, regaining some strength. You know, they were a destroyed country in the 1990s. There was a severe loss of, um, uh, of, of uh, the years of life of Russians. I think the uh, average uh, life expectancy of Russian males fell, if I recall, by seven years in the, the 1990s. I mean, they had a level of um, destruction within Ukraine after the collapse of the Soviet Union that we can barely imagine here. And uh, assuming that they were ever to come back into a state of any kind of uh, internal stability and growth, I think Putin was probably the only person or one of the, he, he was a person who could have done that in a way that could have made peace and had stability with the West. Uh, and instead the West uh, basically became extremely aggressive towards Putin. I think they wanted Russia to stay in a subservient role. And they imagined somehow that by removing him without any thought to who, re- re- who would replace him, that somehow they could drive him from power and everything would be perfect for the United States. Uh, Another kind of uh, craziness. Um, You know, I'll I'll just say one more thing, which this morning, it just occurred to me. It's it's a bit of a kind of a cheap shot, but I looked at the name Anthony Blinken and I thought of the word blinkers or blinkered. You know, if you think of the word uh, blinker, that's like a blinder that you put on a horse. prevents them from seeing to the sides. All they can do is see straight yeah. ahead. And it's right. almost like I want to start calling him Anthony Blank Blinkers. Um, I, he has, and, and I, the reason why I bring this up is that he is representative of an entire category of uh, planners in the United States who I think cannot see beyond an extremely narrow viewpoint that the U.S., what it needs to do is uh, weaken Russia. Uh, it cannot consider the possibility, which is out here on the sides and like a horse that maybe is distracted by things, it would be, have be a source of anxiety for the horse, it would be a source of anxiety for these people to recognize that this path is not the only possible path and that it's not likely to be a successful path. Hmm. I think that's, yeah. That's a great way to look at it. Absolutely. And I think what is the goal at the end of the day? It seems people don't want to talk about the money aspect of this. We try to focus, of course, on Western hegemony and the U.S. dollar. And we really need, I think, in the West, maybe this is just me looking sort of like big picture at this, but I really think we need a boogeyman in the West in order to justify the massive military industrial complex that we spend money on. And Western hegemony, of course, is solidified with us to be able to provide strength and security by you using the U.S. dollar around the world. And now you're seeing, of course, the rise of the BRICS nations. You're seeing the collaboration last week, in fact, a signed agreement between Russia and China to fully move away from the U.S. dollar completely. Uh, This is a major, major setback to Western hegemony. We're seeing more and more countries 
moving away from the U.S. dollar more quickly than ever before. And I think maybe people don't want to recognize that it may be just to, that's it. It comes down to money. It's not really about weapons. It really comes down to money and the power of the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency of the world, perhaps. Yeah, there's a kind of madness. I mean, <clears throat> not only have we been taking mad actions in terms of, I think, militarism with respect to Russia, as opposed to negotiations and diplomacy and trying to recognize the possibility of legitimate security needs that Russia might have and trying to meet those needs at the same time that we look after our own needs and the needs of uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe, some kind of integrated security architecture that would not be a zero sum game where the West gains uh, power on Russia's border and Russia is thereby weakened, but something that all the parties can feel a sense of stability, which is really the only way to create a, a stability in the region. So not just with respect to military and political, but with respect to financial, the U.S. is acting in a kind of crazy way. I mean, the steps they're taking are seem almost designed to just to destroy the U.S. dollar as the international uh, major currency of exchange and the reserve currency. And of course, you know, one of the things that presented has prevented inflation from breaking out wildly in the U.S. in response to all the monetary expansion, you know, the quote unquote printing of money, be it electronic or paper or any form. Uh, has been the fact that when the U.S. prints money, uh, a good chunk of it goes overseas, is, is absorbed into the, um, the, the central banks of other countries and absorbed by individual citizens. Uh, I'm right now speaking from Buenos Aires. Uh, how do people here try to, over the years, they've had tremendous inflation, and how do they try to preserve their wealth? They buy U.S. dollars. So every dollar that's sucked up either by a central bank or by an individual somewhere in the world is removing uh, demand, nominal demand pressure from, uh, from purchases in the U.S. in response to printing money. Uh, uh, so the, the reserve currency is not just important for, you know, geopolitical reasons. It's important in terms of nipping inflation. It's important in having some kind of modest leverage in international transactions. But instead, the U.S. is sabotaging all that, aside from even driving Russia and China together, which, you know, many people would say is the most important thing to avoid. Uh, the, the idea that we are so freely taking liberty with um, uh, expropriating wealth from uh, you know, Russian central banks, which, of course, puts fear into any other country that has money in Western central banks. Uh, I just heard today that the US, that Biden is now making statements that he wants to pressure Russian banks to expropriate wealth of private Russian citizens that keep their money in US banks. I, I mean, it's a kind of madness. Uh, so now we're, we're taking steps that would deprive, uh, you, you know, further deprive the US of the reserve status as you said, BRICS is advancing rapidly. Uh, I don't know enough about what the actual substitutes could be and how quickly those could come into play, but it's very clear that the, the long-term action is uh, going to undercut all the financial power of the U.S., or I don't want to say undercut all of it. It's not a black and white matter, but we are ongoingly decreasing uh, the value of the U.S. dollar in international markets and the security with which we have from having the U.S. be the reserve currency and the major exchange currency. No, such great points. Such great points. You know, Benjamin, I'll get you out of here on this, which is where you think this is going. I'm not asking you to be speculative or predictive, but maybe using history and what they've already told us to kind of guide us here. And what they've already, I think in some, according to you in your book, They've they've wanted to have a replacement to Putin. They've wanted a new government in Russia. I mean, that has been one of the major driving forces. You hear that as members of the United States Senate, members of the yeah. United States Congress have openly said this, that we yeah. need new leadership in Russia. We need a new government in Russia. So is that where we end with this, that this is we're going to keep pushing. We're not going to have a ceasefire. We're not going to have a peace agreement. We're going to keep flooding Ukraine with billions of dollars in weapons till there's nothing left in the hopes that Putin will fall. And is that where we go from here? 
Yeah, I think it's very clear. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a hands-on military expert, but the sources that I've uh, paid attention to that are that are hands-on military experts, they make a very convincing case that there's no way that Ukraine is going to uh, win this war or really come through intact unless there's a full-fledged involvement of uh, NATO, which of course is uh, really a direct pathway to nuclear war. So uh, what? I guess I see two overall big, or maybe perhaps there's three overall big directions. One is that as Ukraine collapses, and it seems like it will collapse, uh, my hope is that the West will start to see reality and start to try to, through some kind of face-saving negotiated settlement, will reach a peace, uh, peace negotiation with Russia. Uh, and that this will end the war on peaceful terms. It won't be optimal for everybody, certainly won't be optimal for the West. The West and its proxy will have, quote unquote, lost the war. Uh, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is that the West doubles down, sends in first uh, troops such as from Macron or Poland or any of the other forces that are talking about some kind of willingness to send in forces. Uh, and that this ultimately leads to direct NATO involvement. So that's another possibility. Uh, a third possibility, which I don't think is so likely, could be a quote unquote frozen conflict where the sort of the battle lines get drawn and both sides just sort of reinforce that and you have a, some sort of demilitarized zone. I guess it's possible. I think the fact that Russia seems to have such an advantage currently in terms of both weapons and manpower that I don't see Russia uh, taking that kind of compromise step, but I suppose that's possible. So those are the three main possibilities as I see them. And honestly, I don't really have a strong sense of what would happen. I mean, so many things have happened in this war that I would not have predicted. I did not predict it would last this long in the first place. Um, I think the whole thing is a kind of madness. And I, I frankly never expected kind of this level of insanity within the US among the political leadership that they would be so blind to the reality, they would have such blinkers on. Uh, right. But yet nonetheless, this is what's happened. So I have no predictions. Uh, I leave that to others who are you know, wiser than I, but I keep my fingers crossed. And I think it's very important, you know, the kind of things that you're doing that I'm trying to do that many others are trying to do, which is really educate the public and to get the public to take very vigorous, peaceful action, but very vigorous action to get us out of this mess. Uh, and we truly are in a mess. Uh, and as, of course, your listeners know, this mess extends not just to Ukraine, but to the Middle East. There's questions about how far we're pushing things in the Far East, et cetera, uh, and with Korea. So it's really uh, a terrible situation we're in. I hope uh, that many people become involved in this issue and try to put pressure and educate their representatives in a way that can get us out of here. And, well, and in, have, the in, in the process, saving Ukraine. Right. Saving human beings at the end of the day. I mean, we're a very anti-war show here on this program. And yeah, you, know, you have an entire generation of Ukrainians dead gone now. Uh, yeah. Thanks to Western involvement. Yeah, I, th I think it's really important to look at this, that our interests are truly aligned with the true Ukrainian interests. They're not conflicting. When we talk about pulling our support out, we are not doing that at the expense of Ukraine. We are doing that for the for the for both our that for both our uh, objectives and for the true benefits of the Ukrainian populace. Right. And I think education is an, an entirely important point of, here because when you have reporters asking congressmen like Jamal Bowman about Donetsk and the Donbass region um, and the genocide that's been going on there for 10 years, he didn't even know where that area was. And yet yeah. he was voting in favor of this war, voting in, in favor of sending more money and weapons to Ukraine. And he couldn't even find that on a map. So yeah. I think not only educating us as Americans, but also our representatives so they know what is actually going on. Maybe our viewers could buy your book and uh, distribute it to members of Congress who continue to funnel money and weapons there. That would be, yeah, that would be wonderful. amazing. That would be amazing. Well, Benjamin, it's been great having you here on the show. Um, I, I want to encourage all of our viewers, go out, pick up this book, support the work that Benjamin's done here. It's a great book. You can buy it uh, right now. It's called How the, the West Brought War to Ukraine. 
and understanding how U.S. and NATO policies led to crisis, war, and the risk of nuclear war. Um, go check that book out. It's, it's, I highly recommend it. It's not a very long book. You won't spend years reading it. Um, but I encourage you to buy it, maybe take it to your libraries, donate it to your libraries, and educate people on this. Benjamin, thank you for your great work on this, and, uh, and we, we look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Hopefully, cooler heads will have prevailed. For sure. And thank you very much for having me, and congratulations on your work, which is very important. Thank you so much, Benjamin.